location. We are really in a very strange situation because this is the beginning of a course that will be continued only in uh, April next year. So, uh, but I hope we, you don't mind having this opportunity because we have here a very special guest, uh, Van Heinemann. Uh, and he will speak a little bit about himself, but uh, I just want to mention to you that he knows the business school inside out. Uh, he was the, the head of an ad hoc committee of the board of trustees of CEU, which uh, uh, was uh, investigating the business school a few years ago, about four years ago, and uh, tried to redefine the purpose uh, and the mission of the business school. And as you can see, there was, I, I think, a great success uh, in that endeavor. And now the business school is in a special situation because the person who was in charge of redefining the, the mission now is delivering a, a mini series of MBA on high performance and high integrity. And uh, he's a very special person because he combines a very long and a very successful business career with government career and private sector and academia career, but he will speak a few things about this himself. I just want to, to mention that last week, Wednesday, he was delivering uh, a, a, a lecture to his class at Harvard Law School. Next day, he was delivering a lecture and participated in a discussion on the profession of, of, of a legal profession at Yale Law School. Afterwards, he was teaching his course at Yale Law School, and now he's here at CEU Business School delivering this. No, course. that that night I was then at NYU Business School. Oh yeah, no, so, okay. So you, you see, so I, I can even follow all these activities. So I, I think we can be really very honored to to have Ben here with us. And without any further ado, Ben. Great. It, listen, it's it's terrific to be here. Let me give you just a tiny bit of background because. You all, again, I can't get to know you at all. I'm not going to ask you to go around the room and say where you're from. Um, but I think people with diverse careers and diverse backgrounds are going to make the best business people because the breadth of perspective, the breadth of understanding how to define problems so that they're not just technical business problems are going to be key to a successful business career going forward. I think it's been true in the past. I think it's even more true today as government, NGOs, the media, are very much part of what business people have to take uh, into account. Uh, in, in 10 seconds, I, I went to college at Harvard. I went to Oxford uh, and did a, a graduate degree in political sociology. I went to Yale Law School. I was fortunate enough to clerk for one of the justices of the United States Supreme Court, a man named Potter Stewart, who's been dead for some years, but who was a very swing justice at the time. I started my legal career as a public interest lawyer, which in the United States means sort of representing the unrepresented. Uh, my specialty was the rights of the mentally handicapped. We pioneered in the field. This is in the early 70s. Uh, then I practiced constitutional law. Then I went in the government and was assistant secretary for policy in the big, big domestic department in the United States. Um, then practiced constitutional law again. And then from 1987 to 2005, I was the, basically the chief legal officer, the general counsel uh, at, uh, at GE. Uh, working for a man named Jack Welch, who some of you may have heard of, who's a relatively well-known, uh, was then a very well-known CEO, and I worked for a man named Jeff Immelt, who succeeded him. Uh, GE at the time, I worked for it um, in terms of market cap, was the number one company in the world. Uh, and at the time I was there, its numbers were roughly uh, $220 billion in revenue, $22 billion in profits, 310,000 people around the world in 100 company, countries um, and doing uh, business, everything from the entertainment business. It owned a U.S. network uh, called NBC uh, to making aircraft engines, power turbines, uh, global finance, a whole variety of things. And my job was the sort of chief advisor to the CEO and to the board. I ran legal, environment, trade, public policy, and tax. So I had a big hunk of the um, private side, uh, the public side of the, of the business. What I want to talk about today, and then, and then in 2005 I sort of uh, retired from going to meetings. 
um, which when you get into business, you'll discover that half of your life is going to meetings, and that may be good or it may be bad, but by the time I got into my mid-60s, I'd been to enough meetings. I decided I would go be free, and so I w have been teaching at uh, <coughs> Harvard and Yale and this place and that and writing a fair amount. Um, one of the things I did after I left GE was to write a book uh, called High Performance with High Integrity, which was based uh, on my experience and my attempt to change the culture to some extent at GE and to some extent express what I believe are the goals of capitalism. I, I mean, I think what I'm here tonight to talk about um, is uh, sort of what I think is, I hope you will think, but at least I think is absolutely fundamental, which is that business has to fuse high performance with high integrity. And high performance means strong, strong sustained economic growth based on superior goods and services. And the goods and services are critical because the customer, in my view, is much more important than the shareholder. We can talk about that if, uh, as we get into this. And let me say at the outset, I really want you to, to interrupt me. Um, today is going to, this first session is going to be sort of an overview and a little bit of kind of a theory. Um, the next two sessions, one's going to be on corruption, one's going to be on global supply chain. <coughs> And the last one's going to be on the sort of governmental um, business relationship. But I, I beg you, I mean, I'm, I'm not accustomed to lecturing. Uh, I normally would do a Socratic class, but you guys are swamped. You're, you've been very busy, so you haven't probably had a chance to read much, and I didn't give you much. So unfortunately, I'm going to be lecturing more than doing a Socratic class. I'd much rather hear from you than hear myself. Um, so I urge you, I urge you to interrupt at any time ask for clarification, say you're crazy, uh, whatever. Uh, so please, please, please take that seriously. Anyway, so high performance based on superior high quality goods and services, providing durable benefits to shareholders and other stakeholders, and importantly, um, basically uh, managing econo economic risk taking, uh, finance, operations, counterparties, all those things. That's performance. What is integrity? Integrity is first the robust adherence to the spirit and letter of formal rules. And I don't say law because it is, of course, law and regulation, but it's also the financial rules. It's all the formal rules uh, promulgated by uh, legal uh, and government, primarily governmental entities that the uh, company must adhere to. And if you're in 100 countries, um, let's just take the little old EU, that, that they, they put out a lot of a lot of laws, and of course, when you're in Hungary or you're in Italy, then there are all sorts of uh, local laws. This is true all across the world. So the robust adherence to the spirit and letter, spirit and letter of the formal rules. Secondly, the adoption of global ethical standards, which basically bind the company. It's not just like Google says, you know, do no evil. That's fine. That's a nice moral precept, but it doesn't mean anything operationally. So the question is, what do you do as a company, and companies do this all over the world, to express global ethical standards which bind the company and bind its employees? Thou shalt not bribe, thou shalt not discriminate, thou shalt have uh, ethical supply chains, and with a lot of details. So that's the second element. And that's combined as well with sort of taking positions on public policy because uh, you have to obey the law as it exists, but companies are often involved <coughs> in advocating f either offensively or defensively for public policy. We're going to talk about that in the last session. Um, I believe that that must be balancing private and public interest. It cannot be narrowly uh, private interest. One of the great problems with companies, in fact, is that I think they miss, certainly the United States, uh, they misuse uh, the political proce process for their own very narrow ends and really when they ought to be thinking more about the public interest. So second element is basically ethics, which is things that bind the company as well as uh, um, public policy, uh, advocacy. And then the third are the values of the, uh, of the employees. Um, and that's the core values of honesty, candor. Honesty, candor, fairness, reliability, and trustworthiness. Um, and you put them all together and they reduce integrity risks. You need risk management on the commercial side in an economic sense but you also need to have an integrity fused with performance so that you, when you're performing, you're performing with integrity, and that's to reduce the integrity risks. I mean, if you pick up the FT today, I don't have it with me, that you know, the, you know, one, one bank paid a million dollar fine, billion dollar fine because of LIBOR uh, rate uh, fixing um, and, and collusion. 
CEO is fired. J.P. Morgan, for those who've been following the United States, is paying you know, literally billions of dollars. Uh, Siemens, uh, as I speak today, one of my protégés, who's the general counsel of Siemens, is giving a class at the Harvard Business School um, on the Siemens case, which I'm going to talk about tomorrow and which you'll, you'll hear about in the spring. Um, so uh, that you, 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 these are things that are absolutely critical to manage because the risk on the integrity side is, is severe or more severe than risks on the business side. Uh, they're both now very, very, very significant. One other thing that I think is really important, I deeply believe, and you guys are, how many of you have uh, had jobs before you've come to business school? Virtually, every, yeah, everybody, great. <laughs> what? Yeah, okay, great, virtually everybody. Well, you've been in organizations, and I think you know that a backbiting, turf fighting organization is no fun. It, things don't get done, it just, it just gets all balled up. That's why these values of honesty, candor, fairness, reliability, and trustworthy are critical in terms of internal relationships inside the company. They're also critical in terms of the relationships that people in the company have with all the outside uh, stakeholders, customers, suppliers, media, regulators, uh, you name it. And so the values are critical, but you cannot have the values, in, in my judgment, unless you have a robust adherence to the formal rules and unless the company takes ethical positions that the, that the employees will say that's the right thing to do. That makes sense. We should do that. We should have a global supply chain uh, that basically treats the workers in third-party suppliers fairly and well. Um, all these things are integrated. So you need to have these values, and that depends on law and ethics, and you need to have integrity fused with performance to, in my judgment, create the kind of trust that is the core of what businesses must have in all, with all their different stakeholders if they are going to be sustainable. There's a lot of talk about sustainable business, and it means a lot of things, and it means sure envir good environmental practice and lots of things. At the core of a sustainable business is high performance with high integrity that creates trust among all the stakeholders. I've taken a little while, you know, I could almost stop. I mean, this is, this is the one idea. Uh, everything that I'm going to talk about for the next period of time flows from this very fundamental idea that you must have high performance, but it must be with high, perf high integrity in the, way, uh, in the way that I mean it. And it's uh, uh, amazing to me that when you talk about selection of CEOs, for example, or the training of people in business, um, they're often worried about you know, profit and loss and new products, uh, new technologies, new geographies, beating the competition. That's all great. That's what you should do. But you have to do it uh, with integrity. Um, I teach at the, uh, uh, the advanced manager's course at the Harvard Business School sometimes. That's sort of 40-year-olds who have just going from their um, uh, technical position or narrow functional position to become general managers. And it's very global. It's usually two-thirds um, non-US. <coughs> and I remember one time doing, doing a, a session on corruption. One of, the, one of these really nice people from India came up to me and said, you know, thank you very much. I said, why? He said, you know, it, it's, the world's changed. You know, we get fired for this stuff. This is really important now in global business. Um, so I think it's important for your careers, but more importantly, I think it's, it's critical uh, for, for global business. And it's the job of the boards, the CEOs, and the top business and staff leaders. But um, I believe also that there are sort of three dimensions of, of corporate governance, which has gotten way too much attention, in my view, that because the subject is really depends an awful lot on the people. You can have all sorts of procedures and structures, and it really depends on the values and the qualities of the people. But there are three dimensions of it. One is the shareholders, um, and I'm not talking about the government. I'm just talking about governance inside sort of the, the, the company itself. There's the relationship between the shareholders and the management. There's the relationship. That's dimension one, the relationship between the board and the, and the CEO and the business leaders and the rest of the company. And lastly, there's the governance by the CEO himself or herself down into the company. That's what I call the third dimension of governance. That's what this is about. This is about how to run a company of fusing high performance with high integrity, creating the culture 
because all the rest doesn't really matter. And the board can select the CEO and they can have some guidelines and they have a role to play. I'm not going to talk about the board in these lectures while well, I'm here today. I can, I can answer questions. It's important, but the third dimension is where it all happens. And that's hopefully where you guys are all going. I mean, you know, you're, you're not going to be a director. Uh, you're not, maybe you're going to go be shareholder activist, nothing wrong with that, but probably not. You're going to go actually run businesses or work in businesses and hopefully run them. <coughs> so this is really uh, critically important. And it's only the CEO on the top uh, leadership uh, that can make these uh, operational decisions uh, that drive integrity deep, deep, deep into the business. All right, the, tonight, this first session is sort of why do we care about this? Um, how do we do it? And what are some of the, some of the tough, toughest problems? And the focus is going to be on, on eight principles. I'm not going to list them now. I'll just say them as I get to them. Uh, because they won't mean much if I just list them. But th I think there are sort of eight critical things that need to be done and then some associated practices. So, and this is in a book that I've written. I think the reading for tonight was to read 30 or 40 pages. It's very short. It was written for CEOs um, explicitly. It was written for practical business people. Um, and a, uh, my theory was that I had three hours to brief them on what to do if they really wanted to do this. So. I think it's a complicated set of ideas. Um, it's very hard to do, but the book itself is, uh, is relatively short and uh, is something that if you have time and maybe when you get in the spring, um, it, it may, may provide a useful frame to your integrity module, uh, which, do, which comes in the spring, Peter, in the, in the, at, at the end of the, it does. at the end of the, yeah, okay. Also the Beg your pardon? The integrity yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, okay, um, well, why do we care about, about this? As I indicated before, one reason we care is for the benefits of avoiding risk. I think what uh, uh, people don't appreciate enough, and there are lots of people who <coughs> gush about business, to me, at the core of capitalism are pressures for corruption. Um, make the numbers, make the numbers, make the numbers, get the product out. Um, you know, have, have uh, the investors think well of you. Lots of times those pressures um, for net income, cash flow, stock price, uh, return on investment, return on equity, sales goals, product launch dates, cause people to cut corners because if they can't do it, they're going to thump it. They're going to commit fraud. They're going to lie. They're going to misrepresent. They're under tremendous, in, in any company, um, most companies are under tremendous pressures to do this. So one of the things you have to recognize is that, you know, at the core of what's happening are pressures to do the wrong thing. You can be um, uh, incentivized and, in, 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 and directed to do the right thing, and that's what we want to talk about. But we have to start from the fact that there's a lot of pressure um, to do the wrong thing. And that's especially true if you're a global company because in an external market there's corruption, weak rule of law, pervasive conflicts of interest. There are new employees from different cultures and companies. There's government extortion, uh, which plays a, a, often a deleterious role in the economy. And then there are all sorts of complications in the distribution of the supply chain. So uh, in a high performance company, compensation promotion are linked to making the numbers, but we have to create a huge counterweight of integrity so it's done in the right way. Um, so why do we want to do it? One is to reduce this kind of risk. And as I indicated, if you look around, if you read the newspapers today, these are billion dollar problems. We're going to talk about Siemens, top leadership's gone, billions of dollars in fines and penalties, untold amount of time spent in terms of internal investigations and diversion of management. One of the things, I don't know if any of you have had this happen to you in your careers before you came here, but when something bad happens and you have to investigate it, there's allegations of, of fraud or environmental uh, violations or whatever the case may be. The diversion is huge. The diversion is huge. So that the cost of these things, not only in terms of publicity and dollars or euros or foreigns or whatever the case may be, is tremendous. But the lost time, the diversion of what you should be doing is also uh, uh, tremendous. But there are also really affirmative benefits, in my view, of integrity uh, inside the company. Uh, for example, transparent processes that promote employee buy-in, empowering employees through voice, 
Um, HR systems that are based on merit, not cronyism or corruption. Uh, connecting the personal values and the company values. The conversions of who you are and what you do, which I think for your lives, if you think about that for a second, let me stop there again. This is one of those thoughts that you might want to keep in your head as you go through your careers. You want your identity to be expressed in what you do and what your work is. There are many other aspects of your life. There's family, there's community, there may be church for some of you, there's community service. But work is a really important part of it. And if you basically are being asked to do things or in a, in a, in a company or setting where you think it's wrong or you think it is not who you are, that is very bad. So I think, again, a high integrity company appeals to many, many people uh, as expressing what they would like to be and so that this congruence between who you are and what you do can be great. In the marketplace, it can contribute materially actually to the, to the, to the integrity of the goods and services. It can reduce the cost and increase the effectiveness of uh, a business processes. It, I headed the environmental group. When we complied with the environmental laws and we did quality um, disciplines to get there, we could simplify the manufacturing processes. We could cut cost out of the manufacturing process and have a better environmental result. I think there are a lot of examples where if you do it the right way from an integrity point of view, it's actually more efficient and better from a business perspective as well. Obviously, integrity enhance, can enhance your brand. It can make you a, a desirable partner for um, uh, suppliers and customers. Um, it can enhance your reputation with shareholders, creditors, and rating agencies. It's a big deal now. When I left GE, I was meeting every year with Moody's uh, and Standards and Poor, Standard and Poor. Where I started in 87, I left in 2005. 87, they didn't want to hear from me. They, they didn't even know I was on the radar. Uh, I was general counsel and public affairs and all this stuff. By the time I left, uh, this was after Enron, WorldCom, after a spate of scandals, they, the rating agencies wanted to hear from people like me on what the company was doing as much as they did from the business people in terms of the soundness of the company. It had become, integrity had become and is now um, a, a, an issue for them. Um, you differentiate your corporation from less scrupulous competitors. Tomorrow we'll talk about how you do compete in countries which are very corrupt and where your competitors are corrupt. I think you can do that, but I'll hold that thought largely till tomorrow. And then in addition to in the company and in the marketplace, it obviously helps you in the, in the global community. Credibility and public debates, which are critically important. I mean, you cannot pick up the paper. Much regulation is about business or affects business directly. Um, credibility with regulators and other enforcers. When you get in trouble, which is going to happen, you're never going to repeal human nature. Uh, there's there's going to be an irreducible minimum of problems that are <coughs> going to come out of your company. In a company like the one I work for with 310,000 people, there's going to be sin. It's the size, it's a city the size of, how, how big is Budapest? Million and seven. All right, well, it's the size of Buffalo or Orlando in the United States. I don't know what the comparable city would be in Europe, but it's, you know, it's a big city. We're not going to get rid of sin. But when you do sin, I mean, the company sins, if you've got a basically reputation, a deserved reputation for integrity, you can work it out with the regulators and the other enforcers. And again, let me just tell you that if they want to get you, they will get you. If they basically think you're a good guy, um, they can work with you to fairly deal with it. You'll have to pay your, your penalty, but it will not be punitive, which is often the case. It will increase the chances of uh, positive media coverage. Um, and you can contribute as well to legitimate durable growth in emerging markets was one of the great issues of our time, which is how are all these emerging markets going to develop legal systems and ethical systems, open, transparent, legitimate institutions uh, that are critical, I think, to business people wanting to do business there. You may have to do business in those environments when they don't have those characteristics, but it's a heck of a lot better if they do have those characteristics in terms of, of your ability. All right. So those are, those are really the reasons. One, to avoid risk, and then two, the various affirmative benefits in the company, in the marketplace, and in broader global society. How do you do it? Well, the critical thing, um, and I'll defer to my newfound friend who is in anthropology, um, is culture. And you might define culture as uh, shared principles, the values, the policy, and the attitudes, and the shared practices, the norms, the systems, and the processes which influence how people feel, think, and behave. Is that, anth is that Anthro 101? Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> so, but uh, it, it, is, it is absolutely uh, critical how people feel and think and behave. And again, you, you, I don't know whether you've gotten to sort of that set of issues just in terms of business culture um, on just the performance side, but it is critical uh, that you have an integrity culture that's woven all the way through the company. Uh, it has to be negative to some extent. There's always going to have to be rules, determination of, of violations, sanctions, penalties. That's just the nature of things. That's how our that's how society works at some level. There's always going to be that sort of foundation of of norms that if you violate, you're going to get punished. But what you really want is an affirmative culture um, where people aren't afraid, but actually want to do it. They want to, to perform with integrity. And that can only happen if there's leadership and management. And these are issues that you guys are going to face sooner than you think. That you're going to go out, and three years from now, you'll have a unit of six people that are work for you, or 10 people, or 50 people. Um, and how you lead them uh, in terms of, of the aspirations that you create and how you manage them in terms of how you deal with the complexities of the, even a smaller job, which can be enormously complex, uh, will be critically important to the creation of an affirmative culture where people really want to do it. And the leaders are absolutely central in a business organization, especially because the business organization is much more hierarchical um, than many other uh, kinds of institutions. So the, you need both leadership, which is defined sort of in the classic uh, business literature as the ability to adapt to change, and you, um, and you need management, which is the ability to adapt to complexity. And if you look at the, again, a company like the one I work for, and you think of all 100 countries, and all federal, state, and local, and all the different laws, I'll come back to this in a minute, but it, there's plenty of complexity, and it requires a huge amount. And without robust practices, which are driven deep into the business operations with real resources and real consequences, the classic phrase that people talk about, tone at the top, is eyewash. It doesn't mean anything. I mean, there's, there's so much hypocrisy in business. Uh, there's so much annual report, PR, feel good, uh, I won't swear, um, but uh, uh, that, that what you really want to do as a business leader and as a person who's growing up in the business is to make sure this stuff is for real um, and not just, uh, not, and not just uh, PR. And the last thing is that uh, on culture is that really on these critical things it must be uniform across the globe. And that's an enormous challenge. Um, that if you have, in, especially say in finance and law and human resources, that you're going to have certain standards that are going to apply. They must apply globally. You can't live with hypocrisy. The, 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 again, all you, you've all had experience. The one thing that employees know um, instantaneously, they can smell hypocrisy. They can smell uh, when, the, when, the, when the organization really doesn't mean what it says. Uh, so this uh, global diversity uh, uh, is fine when you're going to making products and going to market and uh, you know, listening to, to the ground in terms of what you're offering. But in terms of these broad elements of integrity, of observation of the rules, the values, the ethics, it, it has to be global, even if it, it means sacrificing uh, business. Okay, um, let me talk briefly for the next time that we've got, which is about 40 or 45 minutes, and please interrupt if you have any questions about, about some of these principles and try to give you at least a little feel uh, for what they meant. I mean, yes, please, thank God. <laughs> you, 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 you get the bonus. <laughs> the money drops down from the ceiling. There, there was an old quiz show in the United States. If you asked a question that was the right question, a duck came down and you got money. Go ahead. Thanks for coming. Uh, I come from Accenture, and uh, Accenture has its core value, that's integrity, and the clients pay Accenture a lot of money other than a lot of money for just one of the core values. But that's on the macro level, but I work in teams and I see focus in everywhere. So you see hypocrisy it's everywhere, yeah. yeah. It's, it's everywhere, in every group. But just to, you know, uh, pretend in front of the clients, we talk about integrity, we have this and that. But, but would, you, would you say that in the organization, there are, there's lying, falsification, misrepresentation, 
yeah. even up yeah. to fraud? Yeah, still, still the job, but even then the companies portray themselves as they have integrity in the business. And I, I think even GE must be having here in the root, in the grassroots, but on the top management, you still say that you have Well, we'll talk about the grassroots because we tried to, again, as I said before, there's the irreducible minimum concept. We're not, we're not going to repeal human nature. Um, but we, our goal was to have the employees do this in the most furthermost outposts. It was not just to give pitches to the analysts and to the rating agencies and to the media and to the Congress if you got hauled up there. It was actually to create the culture all the way down to the bottom. You know, was it a complete success? Of course not. Um, but I think, I would like to think that if you went into that company, you talked to people, they would say that ma management is really serious about it and therefore we should, we need to do it. And we'll talk too about promotions and pay. I mean, you can make it very um, consequential uh, whether you have integrity or not. But I'm, I'm interested to hear you say that because Accenture is, of course, you know, considered a, you know, a good company. But, uh, and, but, you know, you have a very interesting perspective because, you know, as I said before, the employees really see it. Okay, what's uh, sort of the first principle is really demonstrated and committed leadership, and this really goes to this point. It's the beginning and the end of a performance with integrity culture. The unyielding commitment of leaders and a seamless consistency between their personal traits, their public and private words, and their direct and indirect acts. Business leaders, not staff, must lead on integrity. People would say, well, you're the lawyer, you know, you worry about it. But when I first started at GE, business people wanted to go do business. You know, the lawyers worried about what the law was. The uh, finance staff worried about what uh, general accounting practices were. No. If the leaders, and again, some of you may end up being staff, but some of you for sure will end up being leaders. If the leaders don't grab it and deal with it, never will happen. It will never happen, and the, and the CEO of all people has to really mean it. When I, I worked for two actually very famous, world famous CEOs, and they would each say the same thing when they spoke to, we had two sort of critical meetings. One was the 200 officers in a company of 310,000 people. We only had 200 officers, and that was in the fall. And then there was a meeting of 600 general managers in January, which included the 200 officers. These were sort of the critical sort of agenda setting, um, culture setting. Uh, meetings each year. And at these meetings, the CEOs would say the following, and they'd stand up and they'd point at you and you and you and you, and they'd walk around the room because we, we had uh, uh, these pits, these, um, you know, uh, vertical uh, classrooms that you've, that you've seen. May, they may be some here. Um, and they'd walk up and down the aisle and point at people, and they'd say this. This is now on principle one, demonstrating committed and consistent leadership. They'd say this. Corporation GE, the corporation is built on reputation and performance with integrity and, and, and reputation and trust and performance with integrity is the foundation of that reputation and trust. Each senior leader will be held personally accountable. There will be no cutting of corners for commercial reasons. I'm now the CEO and I'm speaking to all of you who are my officers. There will be no cutting of corners for commercial reasons. No cutting of corners for commercial reasons. Integrity must never be compromised to make the numbers. One strike and you're out. You can miss the numbers and you can survive. You cannot miss on integrity. You're gone. Okay, I mean, it's in the book. It'll all be on the wall when you do your integrity module. The question is, does it mean anything? I mean, you know, that's great rhetoric. And believe me, when you have the first guy I worked for was a powerful leader. I mean, one of the most powerful personalities you'll ever meet. So people are sitting in their chairs, and, you know, <laughs> stuck back against the back of their chair. But the question was, did he mean it? Well, one way you, you've got to mean it is you've got to fire people when it really happens. You've got to fire people when it hurts. And that means you've got to fire the generals, not just the privates. Um, and I'll give you one, one example uh, very briefly. In the early 90s, we had a scandal involving uh, the Israeli Air Force. The United States basically gives money to the Israeli Air Force, and then the Israelis buy U.S. military equipment back, rather than just giving them an F-16 fighter plane, 
we give the Israelis the money, that they then procure what they want, though it has to be U.S. content, and then pay the U.S. supplier with money that's gone from the U.S. Congress to Israel back to the supplier. Okay, there was a, a huge amount of embezzlement and fraud involving our foreign sales manager in Israel and the head of procurement of the Israeli Air Force, who it turns out was also a huge war hero in the 67 uh, war. Um, and they were embezzling money and keeping a Swiss bank account. I don't have to get into too many of the details for the purpose of this story. We had to do an enormous investigation. We fired about 25 people because they knew what was happening. They weren't involved in it. They, they knew what was happening and didn't report it. And we're going to talk about whistleblowing in a minute inside the company. <clears throat> but the question was, what do we do about the head of the business? Um, it was about a $4 billion business. It wasn't huge, huge, huge in terms of a $200 billion company, but it was a darn important business and a very prestigious one because we sold the, we sold engines that went on fighters that went to all the sort of allies uh, uh, around the world. So the question was, what should we do? He did not know about this. Of that we were certain. But the thing had gone on for five years. Many people had known and not reported it. There was not a culture of compliance or integrity. And so there was a debate back and forth. And at the end of the day, the CEO, who was Welch at the time, said, look, if we mean anything about by integrity, we've got to fire people for acts of omission, not just commission. Sure, if they steal money, uh, they embezzle money, the, the, the sales manager in Israel was gone. Um, and in fact, he served a seven-year jail term. But the question was what to do about this business leader. The business leader had been there for 30 years. He was beloved by everybody. Long story short, he was canned. And that sent an amazing message to the company. Secondly, if that happens, then you've got to explain it uh, candidly to the business leaders. I had, was given the, the, uh, 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 the role of talking to the 200 officers, many of whom know, knew him. Um, and I had to explain that he was being fired not for commission, but for omission, for failing to create an integrity culture. You know, I've, spoken a million times in my life. I have never spoken to a group that was as quiet. These business officers realized that a standard was being set that they had to comply with, which is the creation of a culture, not just fi not doing bad things themselves. We made clear that one bad apple in your organization was not going to lead to your demise. But we also made clear, CEO made clear, that if you sort of failed to create this culture, you would be gone. And that was an incredible message. So in terms of the strong message from the CEO, nothing in this case could have been stronger than that. CEOs, business leaders, you know, if you're a sergeant rather than the general, you have to embody the values. As I said before, organizations are exquisitely attuned to hypocrisy. So if you basically, you know, stand up and give a speech and then you go into the room with your senior folks or your colleagues and you say the government's full of baloney and the, this rule is crazy and why are we following it and you do that kind of stuff, it gets around the organization in lightning speed. I mean the informal communication in, a, in, a, in an organization, um, I think any one of you, all of you know having worked there, is incredible. So you have to embody the values. Um, you've got to accept the management uh, responsibilities. You've got to manage this complexity that I talked about before and that means the gritty stuff of business, budgets, systems, processes, controls. Um, you've got to cope with the ever-changing uh, world of normative uh, uh, rules that formally apply to you. Um, this is a business process. This is a fundamental part of what you do uh, every day. And you have to conf confront uh, this complexity head on. And you've, the business leaders have to do it and they have to own it. Um, so. Uh, that's, that's, that's one. That the, if the CEO doesn't resource it and doesn't care about it and doesn't discipline people and doesn't really live the commitment that he's making or she's making when they speak, nothing will happen. Uh, I've seen it a million times and again, just hold the thought because when we talk about Siemens, um, you know, who had a fine set of ethics or Enron, they all had fine sets of ethics and integrity and policies. It's just that they didn't mean anything. Um, so that's, that's point one. Point, principle two is you've got to manage uh, performance with integrity as a business process. Um, you have to confront this complexity head on and you've got to build uh, an integrity infrastructure that is basically 
part of business operations. It's not, again, something just imposed by the staffs. That means, in, an es in essence, you have to pr prevent, you have to detect, and then you have to respond. You have to investigate. You've got to discipline. You've got to change the systems. You've got to look sideways to see if the systems in one situation <coughs> are problems with the systems in one situation really apply uh, when you have peripheral vision and you look everywhere. And it's, again, this is not easy stuff. Let's just take prevention. You've got to look at all the rules that cut across all your different business processes, whether it's IT, manufacturing, sales, technology, finance, um, all the places in which the, what those folks do, places where the law or, or the accounting rules bump into it. So you have to map the process. You've got to look where the risks are, and then you've got to figure out risk abatement, whether it's checks and balances, whether it's um, certifications, whether it's education and training, uh, whatever it is. This is a hard, grunty thing. And again, unless the seat, and people, it's not a natural act. They'd much rather be spending their time um, you know, making products and selling and making profits. And that's great, performance with integrity. But the, if the CEO doesn't basically hold the, the business leaders accountable for doing this, um, it really, it's really not going to happen. You've got to have A players. Yes, sir. So uh, uh, you're talking about clearly defining that uh, this is black and this is white. Uh, many a times what happens is, uh, even in my organization, I have seen that we were handed ethics booklets. Uh, they had uh, rules uh, in them, but they became more of guidelines. So they were easy to play with or flout. So uh, does it mean that you have to clearly define that this is the line and you do not cross this, this is black and this is white? No, it, it, there's, there is certainly some of that and there's certainly a lot of gray. And so the, a lot of the education and training is sort of where is the line and then how does it start to get gray as the facts change a little bit, where it's not just a clear bribe, but someone asks you to basically have a contract with the daughter of the prime minister who's going to provide you with coal. You know, is that a bribe or not a bribe? Um, a classic kind of situation. And so then, then you have to basically have a system where people know to call home, where they, they're sensitive enough to these issues so that they know there is a problem and that even if they can't solve it, they have to basically find out what the right answer is. So it is absolutely not black and white. It is because most of the world is gray. I mean, a lot, a lot, you know, there are certain things you can't fix prices, you can't divide markets, you know, you can't violate the, uh, the environmental laws blatantly. But a lot of these things, of course, are judgment. So what you're trying to do is create uh, an environment where people are sensitive to when they're getting close to the line. <coughs> that they have a discussion about it, that it's an open uh, community, and we're going to discuss what's the right thing to do under those circumstances. And as we'll discuss in a minute, we're going to discuss also what's the right thing to do, even if the law uh, is, is minimal, you may want to go beyond the law. So I it's a very good point, but this, this absolutely uh, takes that into account, and indeed takes that as a premise, because they're relatively Many, many things come in shades, of, in shades of gray, and you've got to do it. Um, you've got to make management with integrity reviews where you look and see how the business are doing real events. I don't want to get into, into too much detail, but I want to give you a feel that this is really a very profound business process that must be followed. And that leadership uh, uh, it, it means personal engagement. We used to have sort of a, a, a saying, you know, do it, don't delegate it live it, don't preach it, that the, the top leaders have to be involved in all the problems and solutions to the problems, um, in some of the key training, and certainly some of the key reviews. So um, these two things, the, the, the consistency and commitment, which is principle one of the leader, and then building in these processes into the business with business leaders doing it is, is, is vital. Principle three is to adopt global ethical standards. Um, the question is not just, is it legal? or is it according to GAAP? Uh, I teach, the main course I teach in the United States is exactly on this subject, where the, uh, I mean, I teach Harvard Law students, where the thesis of the court is, the first question is illegal, the last question is it right? And then, and that's far beyond, maybe far beyond what the law requires, um, but it's still something that should be done in the interest of the company. So it's, the ethical standards question is asking, is it right? And it's, uh, there are all sorts of different reasons that you can decide that you're going to commit the company 
to do something beyond what the law requires. It may reduce the, uh, uh, the risks of an integrity miss. It may improve the internal function of the company. It may create reputational and uh, other advantages in the marketplace. It may enhance the global standing. And for example, at, at the company I worked for, we had a flat prohibition against bribery, both public and private, regardless of whether the technicalities of the law applied. Uh, no discrimination. Uh, we built all our plants our plants to environmental health and sa safety world standards, not to local standards. We just said we're, you know, we're, we're going to make it simple. We're not going to vary it, whether in one country or another. We're just going to say what's the best world standard at the time, and we're going to build to that. Ethical sourcing, responsible lending, uh, reduction in greenhouse gases. A lot of you do a lot of things. You can make a lot of decisions, and and most companies, most big multinational companies, do this. Um, it's not talked about a lot. Uh, uh, or it's talked about in a PR sense, but in an operational sense. But making these ethical choices, going beyond what the law requires, is a huge part of being in global business. Um, and it's a process. It's not just sort of picking it out of your ear. And it's not, there, we can have a great debate about whether it's prudential, meaning it's in the sort of in the enlightened self-interest of the company, or whether it's moral, whether the corporation is a moral being. Um, that actually follows the dictates of moral philosophy. Uh, we don't have to resolve that tonight. It's a good issue for you guys to discuss um, as, you go, as you go along in your careers. At a minimum, it is in the enlightened self-interest of the company. And at a minimum, it draws on moral ideas like fiduciary responsibilities or transparency or loyalty or dignity of people. Um, but you uh, need to, to basically have a process for doing this. And the process is to basically look at what the issues are that are being presented to the company. If you work in, in almost any company with any kind of global reputation, whether it's the NGOs, the governments, um, your employees, sometimes your customers, there are going to be all sorts of demands put on you to do things beyond what, you're, what the law requires. And so you basically need to accumulate those, you've got to triage them, you've got to decide which ones you, can, you think are important at the time to analyze, you can't do them all. You've got to analyze them, you've got to determine that, the, uh, that there is cost, but that that is going to be an investment, um, and that the, the, the benefit is going to be either reputation or better processes, or satisfying some stakeholders. There are, there's a lot of variation, um, but it's really rooted in the company's history, culture, and mission. And it is, a, it is, in my judgment, a, a systematic process. <clears throat> the accounting period, if you will, is not next quarter. It's a, over a period of years. And it's a decision often that needs to be made, made at the highest level because it's committing the company to something that it doesn't have to do. Um, and an example would be, yeah. Um, what about companies without a global presence, small and medium businesses, things like that? And not only that, but you know, scaling them. How, where does it all start? There's a bunch of budding entrepreneurs in our class and, you know, we might start with a one, one man show and grow from there. So where do we start? Where, you know, it's, it's easy for, for me to think I'm going to go into a big corporation where a lot of these standards have already be, been set and it's easy well, to Well, I think, I think there, there's a ton, I mean, if the, you're, the answer is that there's a ton of literature out there on codes of conduct, big, little, and small companies. Uh, there's a lot of writing in the sort of business journals about what are the kinds of principles that companies consider. So th I think there is, in fact, a significant b uh, uh, amount of source material that you can, in fact, look at to make a determination of what's going to guide you as you start a, a, a fledgling company as opposed to dealing with, you know, this huge behemoth, you know, the belly of the beast that where I was. So I, th I, think, I think there is a good answer to that, actually. And I was, for example, considering health and safety policies and standards, things like that. You know, a lot of uh, SMEs, they've already got their budgets just so stretched out, trying to make ends meet, things like that, pay rent for the end of the month, things like that. But, um, you know, there are laws in place, and there's always so much more you can do with regards to your environmental and particularly health and safety policies. But how, how well, I think for the, for, the, for the tiny companies, you still have to obey the law. I mean, I don't, I don't, that's not an option. I think the question of whether you want to go beyond the law is going to turn to some extent on your size, your scale, your impact, 
your employees' uh, morale um, and sort of the demands on the money at the beginning, but it doesn't mean that that doesn't evolve over time. Um, so I think at a minimum, without doubt, you have to follow the law. Whether some of these ethical things are nice to do for small companies, I think they're must-dos for big companies. Whether they're nice to do is for small companies, and you may have to wait, I think is a fair point. I mean, I'm, I'm not here being dogmatic about it, because uh, the, the budget is tiny, and the, these things have their cost. It, it depends, again, we have to talk specifics. Um, you, you wouldn't discriminate uh, in the company. I mean, th that might not cost much, just you don't do it. Um, uh, you know, you might, depending on the community, you might which if it had certain environmental problems, you might do a little extra because it would be good for business. So a lot, a lot of this is very contextual. I'm just saying it's imp very important that it be absolutely on people's radar. Yeah? Uh, as an em employee, how do you find out about the company, how ethical that company is? How, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. How do you find out about a company or a bank, for example? Like if I want to choose an ethical bank, how do you find out? which is ethical and which isn't. Because we all always hear about the scandals, but I never really know of good examples. Like, I want to choose an ethical bank. Uh, how do I know which one is ethical? Well, you know, that, that also is a great question. As, as entry-level folks, at, at a higher level, and I've written a fair amount about this, people should do due diligence. If you're coming in at a high level in a company, you should basically do due diligence. You should get your job, and then you should go talk to them and ask to interview people and see, get your own feel for what the culture and processes are like. You may not want to be too aggressive about that before you get the job because they may or might, may not want to hire you. You can do some of it, but after you have the job, but before you've accepted, you can do it. There's also, um, you know, a certain amount uh, written on these companies. You, s you know, a lot of them are in the newspapers. A lot of them are, you can look at their SEC filings or the equivalent in the, in the EU of matters that are pending. Um, you know, you can, when you're talking to, about uh, taking the job, you can talk about to your fellow employees and say, you know, is this all bunkum or are, is the company serious? Um, I think if you thought about it, there would be a variety of sources, but it requires diligence. You can't, you know, just assume because it's got a fancy name that it's going to have a fancy record. Um, and in fact, we've seen, and I would say that the banking system, the financial system, is particularly challenged today. I mean, the number of problems they've got, <laughs> you know, I could write on the, on the whiteboard for the rest of the hour. Um, so I think, I think you have to map out different kinds of sources, some personal, some written, and, and do, the, do the absolutely best you can. And one other thing, the, the, I think the hardest thing in business is you've got to be prepared to say no. Uh, and I'm going, to come, I'm going to come to sort of the partner guardian problems that everybody faces, but, but go ahead. I just wondered whether there, there was like an organization or a website or a, which um, selects and reports. Sure, I think, I think it, it depends, you know, which industry, what country. Um, my guess is, yes, there are, there are lots of watchdog websites that sort of and you have to take them with a grain of salt, too, I think. Um, they may not all be completely accurate. Um, but, but I think, th I think they're in this day and age, there are a lot of sources, I guess is all I'm saying. But it's also the personal source, the personally going and talking to people, that's really critically important. Let, let me just keep going uh, real fast so I can finish this part. Um, OK, so commitment on the part of the CEO, build in the business process, have a process for doing ethical standards. Have it be decided at a high level. Uh, which I was going to say, uh, I'm going to give another example. Early in, the, in uh, uh, the beginning of this century, after 9-11, there was a lot of pressure on our company to stop doing business in Iran, um, partly from uh, firemen and, and police group, pension groups in New York who'd been uh, victims of 9-11, and they somehow thought that Iran was involved, uh, partly uh, because the U.S. foreign policy talked about Iran in very unflattering terms, partly that there was unquestionable evidence that Iran was aiming for the bomb and also was uh, supporting the insurgents uh, uh, against American troops. 
Uh, now, we're a global company, and that's a whole other set of issues. But there was a lot of, there were, there were a lot of reasons why you know, Iran was seen as a somewhat of an outlier state. Normally, a multinational will do business anywhere. We're not in the position of making geopolitical judgments uh, about which country's good and which country's bad. But we made the decision, uh, because of the unique situation of Iran, to take no new orders. Um, we basically did $500 million a year of oil field work in Iran. We built compressors, which are things that move oil and gas along pipeline, very important. Um, and we basically just said we will give that business up um, because we think uh, that Iran is sort of on the outer edges of, of sort of where countries are. Turned out, we did this early in the 90s, it turned out, of course, that the, and we thought we'd get killed by Siemens and all the European countries. Uh, that would be the end of it. But it turns out, as you know from reading the newspapers, that in fact, for a variety of reasons, the international sanctions regime has been much broader than we would have ever imagined, some of it by law, um, and it's had an impact. But, that, but that, the only reason I give you that example is that was something we talked about with the board of directors for about two years, or a year and a half, before we finally decided uh, to do it, because it was such an important decision as a multinational, and because the, the clients, the customers, were the huge oil companies that we served all over the world. And so if you tell them, well, we're not going to serve you in Iran, they say, well, what, what, what kind of supplier are you? You know, you're, you just are, you're the cr you're crazy Americans. Here you go again. You know, um, we can never count on you. You've got all these crazy political ideas, and you're, you know, what are you doing? Why don't you just give us the compressors? So it was, it was a, uh, and we can talk about that one, too. It's not, that one's not free from doubt. <laughs> I mean, there's, there are a lot of ways you can, you can argue that. Um, but that was, the, my only point there is that you had to decide that at the highest levels of the company because it was an extremely consequential decision. Okay, um, another principle is you absolutely um, have to foster uh, awareness among the employees, uh, knowledge and commitment. I mean, these things, the things I'm talking about, um, I hope as you have your careers that, you know, some of these things will vaguely stick in your mind because it, this is based on, a lot of this is based both on my experience and a lot of reading and talking to a lot of people. It's not just based on my own personal experience in the place that I worked. One of the advantages of what I was able to do is I was very fortunate. I was able to travel around the world and everywhere I went, you know, if I went to China, I would meet with CEOs of, in China companies. I would meet with general counsels in China companies. I would meet with the media. And so, you know, it was a wonderful education for me. It was an incredible experience. And so some of these things are, are drawn from a lot of different uh, sources. But fostering employee awareness, knowledge, and commitment is critical. They have to understand the obligations. They have to understand uh, the right things to do under these duties. And they have to know how to ask the questions when they're not sure. That a huge part of the education is that. And that the, um, the process of learning, I mean, think of you guys. How do you teach people so that they actually retain something? Um, I mean, ask yourself what you're going to walk away from in a year from now, what are you going to remember of this night? Not too much. You know, a year of school. But when you're, when you're tr training people in a business setting, they got to remember there's got to be retention. It's important. Or you're just really wasting your time. So you've got to articulate uh, the word and you basically, in my judgment, have to explain why, not just what. Stating the rule is OK, but you connect with people if you say, well, here's why we're doing this. This is why it's important. This is, you know, appeal to their intellect and their spirit. Uh, don't just hand it down. Um, and so you have to articulate it in a way. You have to explain why. And then you've got to deliver it in an, in an exciting and, and interesting way. But most companies train people in all the business disciplines. You know, you can, you can go to these big companies and get training in manufacturing or sales or um, marketing or whatever, IT. Um, and this part of it is cod liver oil. And you've got to learn to make this stuff uh, really, really, really interesting. We were fortunate that one of our subs, subsidiary companies was NBC, which is a US television network. And so we got them to make a film, a 20 minute film, on our problems, on some of the bad things that we had done um, that was very dramatic, tremendous production values, um, and, and it was narrated by one of the 
talking heads on the NBC News. We showed it to every employee the first day they came to the company. And we showed it again. And we got tremendous response because not only was it kind of entertaining, you know, Israeli ju fighter jets taking off and then, you know, the guy behind bars. I mean, I'm, it was, they were very vivid um, <coughs> videos, but, but people were also impressed that we were very candid about sort of, you know, it's like this was not a goo-goo, we're a great company and we're, we want to be honest and, and, and wonderful. It was about all the goofs that we've made and all the risks uh, that exist. So that, that was very important. Um, and then we had a program which we called 3T, which was tracking, training, and testing. I'm just giving you a flavor of some of these things, but these are really concrete <laughs> things that are operational, that, that really can work. Um, the tra tracking, training, and, and, <coughs> and, and testing was that you basically had to risk assess every job. Not every job's the same. If you're selling equipment in Western China, that's one kind of risk. You know, if you're running a huge plant in Holland, um, which if it blows up will take half of Holland with it, that's another kind of risk. Um, so you had to basically risk assess the jobs. You had to train people for those risks. And then we basically, about every three to six months, would test to see if there was retention. Um, so that was why it was 3T. And, you know, there, there are millions of ways to do it, but that kinds of stuff is really important. Also, you've got to address um, cultural differences head on. Um, I'm going to talk in a minute about uh, the ombud system, but here in Hungary, for example, uh, we were the, GE was the first person to buy a Hungarian com company after the wall came down. We bought Tungsrum, which was the Hungarian lighting company. And uh, we have a system of ombudsmen, but the, not surprisingly, people who lived in, in Hungary, between the, the Gestapo and the Stasi, were not too inclined to make reports to authorities on their fellows. I mean, there, there was a you know, very, many of you know far more better than I do, you know, a very tragic history in this part of the world. So we had to work around those cultural differences, or in China, on conflicts of interest. And the way we did in Hungary is we found a very senior woman, in fact, who worked in the factory, who had nothing to do with these issues, and asked her if she would be the intake person, if people could come talk to her, because they trusted her. And, and she, I think, you know, appreciated the importance here. It was, it was not for political purposes to hurt people. It was basically to try to uncover th their problems. Or in China, where conflict of interest, all of China is connections, inter-family relationships. From a Western company point of view, that would be considered a conflict of interest that has to be cleared. So anyway, the point is, in these education and training elements, the sensitivity, and I guess, how many countries do we have represented in this room? 22, did you tell me? Yeah. yeah. The, the sensitivity to how these different cultures work and sort of, you, you know, how you communicate these important principles in ways that make sense to them and that deal with their sensitivities, uh, I can't say, you know, how uh, important, important it is. Um, and this gets to the sort of the, 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 um, the almost, we're almost at the end of the list principle, which is to give employees voice. That in most scandals, and again, you guys have had enough experience in organizations to know this, in most scandals, uh, employees knew that there was something going on, but they were afraid. They didn't know where to go, they were afraid they'd be reprimanded or things would happen to them. So building a system where employees have voice, where they can speak up and that they will, there will be no retaliation is absolutely critical. Uh, it, when I left, um, <laughs> just a very personal funny story, I went to see the CEO when I, early in my regime. We didn't really have a very good system. And I said, we really ought to do this. And he kind of looked at me. He said, people just going just to complain. We were restructuring. We were changing. Uh, we were downsizing a lot of companies. The company was very bloated. So they're just going to complain, complain, complain. It's going to be a disaster. And I said, well, um, I think you're better off having them complain to us than go to the U.S. attorney or the prosecutors, the magistrates in France or the whatever in the Lanz, uh, in, in Germany, Lanz in, in, in Germany. Um, and so uh, after about three sessions, he kind of just kind of looked at me and didn't say no, and I took that as yes. Um, and so we built this system, which when I left, basically had 600 people in 45 nations in 31 languages. You could report 
uh, we had a long uh, sort of, uh, we had a short um, statement of, of our policies and then a fairly uh, complex but hopefully readable statement of guidelines that help people understand what they were, not to mention all the other training. Um, and basically you had a duty to report if you th had a concern. And the word concern was critical because we didn't want the employees to have to make the judgment about whether or not there'd been a probable violation. That's sort of legalese, that's legal stuff. All we wanted them to tell us was were they concerned about something. Um, whether it was commercial risk or legal risk or ethical problems or whatever. Uh, and that they had a duty to report that. And again, in that Israeli case that I mentioned where people didn't report, uh, 20 of them, 25 of them were fired for failing to report. So that's one essential part of it. But the flip side of it is that you must take what they say seriously. You've got to investigate it fairly. If it goes this way, you've got to follow it, even if it gets a senior leader. Um, you must do it professionally and promptly. And of course, uh, there can be no retaliation. So this, this concept, which most companies have now, but how these systems work, I don't know if this is something you have a chance to get into in the spring, how these systems work, what the problems are. I mean, you're basically running a huge system inside a, a sort of private ordering inside a big company to make sure that these employees uh, have voice. There are other things, auditing, management reviews, I won't get into all the rest of it. But this idea of voice in terms of the concept of integrity and making people feel that the company really wants to hear if there's a problem as opposed to having it swept under the rug is um, you know, very, very important. And you really want a self-cleansing culture uh, that uh, detects and deters. Uh, there's no backbiting if reports are handled professionally. Some people worry that people will file a report about some enemy in their, in their work group who they don't like. But if, the, if the, those kinds of complaints get sorted out quickly, if it's bogus, um, then people stop doing it because they know that they can't game the system. The system's going to be run professionally by professionals and will work. And so cheap shots don't work. Okay, pay for performance with integrity. Um, huge debate uh, about pay for performance. It's been going on for 15 years. Um, my, I believe it's very fundamental that people be clearly compensated for integrity. You would people say, well, that's what you expect them to do. Yeah, you expect them to do their job well too. So it's just part of compensation. And there are lots of ways uh, of, uh, of measuring them. Um, if you articulate principles and practices like ones I've articulated in this, in this book, but the company adopts them, you can basically see whether the business leaders and various other people who are responsible are doing it. You can basically compare to other businesses in the company if you have a multi-business company. <clears throat> we used to have um, basically charts where we would list the businesses here and we'd list, say, environmental problems here. And businesses got coffins or halos, depending on whether they had exceedances or other environmental problems. And if you come in a room, you're a business leader and you're a business leader, and I'm the CEO, and we put up a chart, and you've got a coffin because you're at the bottom of the list, and you've got a halo because you're at the top, that is a very powerful motivator, and you're, you're there among all your peers. Um, so that, that can, comparison to other businesses uh, can work. You can compare to other businesses outside, although the information is a little harder to come by. But one way to deal with that is to get a regulator who has spent his life looking at companies and is now retired to come in and do a regulatory audit of you and give you a sense of how, of how well you're doing. You can do employee surveys. We asked a simple question. There are no com compromises around here when it comes to conducting business in an ethical way. And then, you know, agree, disagree. Um, and you'd be surprised how important just in that this was asked of about 140 of the 310,000 people, the, basically the salary employees. So you can do that and then you can do what are called 360s, which are detailed reviews of people um, and more detailed uh, sort of um, focus groups. Uh, to get things uh, going. And then you can obviously have goals and objectives for your business leaders just as you do in everything else. Because there always are going to be issues that whether well, you have to build up the environmental staff, you've got to hire a new uh, trainer in India, whatever the case may be, you've got to solve this problem with the, uh, the European Commission, um, you've got to basically deal with the embezzlement problems in Russia. Uh, there always can be goals and objectives. So this is, this is critical. Um, and lastly, for all of you, 
there is the fundamental problem in business. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just a question. I was actually going to ask how exactly you measure these. And uh, if, if you said goals, you, you said you can't, uh, you can't perfect humanity, right? You're always going to have issues. So do you set benchmarks for these performance standards? And if so, do you set them at perfection or? No, 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 no. And the, the, the goals and objectives will be very specific things that have to be done. Finding the new environmental health and safety manager, solving the problem of embezzlement in Russia. It would not be, it might be getting your lousy answer to that question up higher so that people had more confidence. But it would be m m the goals and objectives part of it. There are about five different measurements. The goal and objective part would be much more specific problems that they had to solve and would not be too abstract and pie in the sky, if, okay. if that answers. So these measurements and goals and objectives. Do they only, when do they come into play? Is it when there's a Every year, every year, every year, every year. The, 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 every the, again, I mean, it's classic sort of management. If, you know, if, you, if you're this, you're ahead of a division, the CEO and you have a conversation, or <coughs> me and the people who work for me have a conversation at the beginning of the year <coughs> where, you know, you say, they say, here are the 15 most important things I'm going to do this year, and divide it into different areas depending on what your job is. Um, but one of those is going to be integrity and you're going to be measured and some of it's going to be objective and some of it's going to be qualitative. The only point is it should be part of compensation, that's all. That if you don't have it be part of compensation, it's, it's seen as sort of out there and extraneous. If you're trying to fuse performance with integrity to do the kinds of things I'm talking about, then you need to make this part of promotion and comp so that the people feel it. Everything I'm talking about here is real world business stuff that affects how people, the culture, how they you know, feel, think, and behave. One more. Uh, sure. When you implemented the ability for people throughout the company to report things they saw that they were concerned about, did you have a way of gauging the ethics in the company and sort of measuring if there was a, a company-wide reaction to that? We, yeah, I mean, it was one of these things where we actually wanted people to report. So if we got a lot of reports, we didn't view that because it was a new system and we were continually encouraging people to do it. We didn't worry if the number of reports was 1,800 one year and 2,200 the next year. Um, if we, we would then break it apart by geographies, by different kinds of complaint, whether it was, you know, employment law or antitrust law or corrupt uh, bribery. Um, and so we would look at the data and see if there were trends that way. But we basically wanted people to report, so we weren't too concerned about that. And the reality was that only a quarter of the reports that came in, because we had this very broad standard, report a concern. A lot of them were human resources issues. They just wanted information. And only about a quarter sort of led to real investigations. And then of those that led to real investigations, only a quarter of those showed some kind of wrongdoing. And of those, very few were monster things, but it was a, but sometimes they were, and it was really valuable to have that safety valve. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that we have a different culture here uh, of not having bad experiences of reporting um, um, during the communist uh, big times, and uh, I, I totally agree. I, I live in London, and, and um, I, um, I had problems with this uh, within the company, that uh, uh, people were reporting each other instead of communicating uh, things each other um, and I think that meant um, a sense of um, a loss of trust <coughs> and I don't think that was very beneficial for the company and, and it was certainly not beneficial for the for teamwork. So how do you see this? Uh, well first of all some of these things you know perhaps you can just go to the manager or you know and, and work it out <laughs> and not put it formally into the system but my view is that if, the, if you basically have this system it will deter people from doing bad things that if you're sitting around a table trying to make the quarter and somebody says, well, you know, let's pull some of the sales in from, uh, from next quarter and count them in this quarter, which is an accounting violation, but there are 10 or 12 people sitting around the table, you don't know whether someone's going to basically put it, put it into the system that you've made this suggestion of doing something that's blatantly unlawful. So it does, it does have a deterrent effect. And as I said before, if you basically winnow out the very fast, the bogus ones where you're just, there's backbiting and crap because people are, are uh, don't get along, 
and those don't go anywhere. You know, we, we, we did not find that it created an a, 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 a environment of mistrust. We found that, that people actually thought the system worked well. The, you know, the legal staffs and finance staffs investigated it, was handled professionally, um, and that uh, it was very consistent with this overall approach to integrity. We did not have uh, that problem. But I think it was that we always made the point that, you know, we don't want people to take out personal vendettas and have personal fights through this system because it's not going to work. So, I mean, it's a fair point, and, you know, you can't say. Last, last point, I've got three more minutes, then we all can take a break. Um, is that the sort of the last principle is that we're, we're all partners and guardians in these companies. And if there's sort of another thought that you might take away and you, when you think about your careers, is that we're all partners with each other and with our business leaders to basically get the job done, to have high performance. But we're also guardians of the company in terms of having, making sure the company meets the standards of integrity. Uh, you know, rules, ethics, and values. And so many times the leaders are, don't necessarily want to hear that. They're in a hurry. They want to make a quick decision. Uh, they don't want to find the facts. Um, they don't, you know, they just want to run right over you. Not necessarily because they're bad people, but that's just sort of, at least my observation, the, the nature of CEOs is that patience is not normally one of their qualities. Um, and having debates, uh, is not necessarily something they want to do. And so every one of us has to have the kind of courage uh, where you can stand up and say, stop, we really need to discuss this. Here, here's why. And it's not, it's not often easy. If you can get them into that discussion, often a good CEO uh, will listen. But getting them there is a problem. So having this dual role that's especially true for the lawyers and the finance types because they are cost centers and they basically have to help the CEO accomplish, the business leader accomplish their business goals. But they are also the protectors of the company. But I think that's true in the, my way of looking at the world and the, at the corporate beast. Um, it is also true uh, for all the people uh, who are in, around the table as business leaders. Because you're, you're, you're all going to be there around the table, uh, for at least for a while, probably in, in functions, whether it's finance or whatever it is. You're, you're probably not, no one's going to go out and be a general manager on day one, at least in a, in a larger company. Um, in the smaller company, you're, you're not only the general manager, you're the chief cook and bottle washer at the same time, but that's a, that's a different issue. Um, and so we all have a responsibility for this. All right, we're at the witching hour. You guys get 20 minutes off. And I, again, I, I really do apologize for droning on and lecturing. I don't think it's the most effective way to communicate ideas. But I do think, based on many years in the trenches, that these are ideas that are operational and that really do go to the core of what business should be about. And I don't have to tell you that we've never been in a period when business has been in such low repute uh, certainly in the United States, I don't think it's a lot better uh, in Europe. And the challenges are only going to increase uh, with globalization and with competition from countries where they don't necessarily have uh, the performance with integrity ethic. Anyway, thanks for listening.